defending his uh, PhD thesis in the material science department. Uh, it's always a great pleasure uh, to introduce your student on his or her thesis defense, and in this case, a particularly emotional one. Uh, so Shafi is my very first student at Stanford, uh, co-advised with Nick Meloche. And it's been quite a journey, and I've been thinking about what to say this morning, but it's really hard uh, to come up with all the um, narrative describing his great progress, his personality, and so forth. So I thought I would just basically thank him for a number of things. So Xiao Fei um, came to the lab as the very first student, so thank you for joining the group. Uh, it was literally the seed, the nucleation event uh, that was needed. Thank you for setting up the lab. I think he spent about half of my startup package. Uh, so thank you for that as well. Uh, thank you for being a uh, experimental gold finger. Uh, Xiao Fei is very special in that not only he has a theoretical grasp of what he does, but also everything he touches just works. Uh, he's working in an area which I am new to as well. He did not have uh, senior students, postdocs, or other students to work with in his first uh, two years here, so basically dead in his own. Thank you for listening to all of the bad advice I gave and all the crazy ideas I came up with, and thank you for sending me straight on many of them. And I'm very happy to say that um, working together with you, Nick, and others, we were able to make great progress in a field which is very busy and with many, many different kinds of work. So today, uh, Xiao Fei will spend the next 45 minutes talking to us about his novel contribution to the field of photoelectrochemistry. As I mentioned, this is a very um, developed field, uh, has many outstanding material systems, so we struggle a lot to think about how we can contribute. And Xiao Fei put a great amount of work into this and for the past five years really uh, did breakthrough work on contributing to this important topic of storing sunlight uh, in chemical bonds. So before I ask Xiaobei to start his thesis presentation, I would like to thank you all for coming, and of course thank Xiaobei again uh, for uh, sticking with me for the past five years. And uh, well with that, Xiaobei, uh, please show us your work. Thank you. Thanks, Will, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to my defense today. So the title of my thesis is Elevated Temperature, Photo Each Chemical Water Splitting. One of the key bottlenecks for solar, uh, solar energy utilization is the geographically uneven distribution. So as you can see from this map, California has abundant solar energy to utilize. We actually became the first state that has more than 5% annual electricity production from solar energy. However, if you look at Chicago or New York, these big cities do not have much solar energy to utilize. So it is critical to figure out how to deliver the solar energy from California all the way to the East Coast in order for solar energy to become a major contributor for electricity production across the US. So due to the high energy density, and transportability, chemical fuels remain the most promising medium to store and provide solar energy when and where we need it. And my research is focused on hydrogen production from water, which we call solar water splitting. So foliage chemical cell is a particular device that people have researched for many years to achieve this solar water splitting. It, it is composed of an anode and a cathode First, both immerse in aqueous electrolyte. So as we shine light onto this device, oxygen and hydrogen can be released from anode and cathode respectively. So in this particular drawing, it is a photoanode design because the anode is a photoactive material. While we can also have a photocathode if cathode is photoactive. So typically, a photoanode is composed of an N-type semiconductor which bends up as it meets an electrolyte. So once the device is under illumination, electron hole pairs can be generated and separated by this built-in potential. And quasi Fermi level splitting will be generated within the semiconductor, which provides the hole. So as the hole is driven to this interface, it can oxidize the water to produce oxygen, while the electrons will be collected through the external circuit all the way to the cathode, and then 
complete half reduction, which releases hydrogen. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the photoanalog. The photoanalog is more important nowadays because oxygen evolution reaction is much slower than the hydrogen evolution reaction. So when I first learned the photo and photo chemical cell, I want to figure out what I can contribute to this community. So I took a step, step back and look at the fundamental picture of solar energy conversion. So as a device receives solar irradiation, it can first it, uh, it can either convey the heat to a heat engine driven by the temperature gradient. Such a heat engine is like thermionic emission converter, thermal chemical cycle, or thermal electric. It can also directly produce useful work by the driving force we call photovoltaic, such as solar cell or the photo edge chemical cell that we are going to talk about today. Besides these two driving forces, there is another important parameter, which is the device temperature, that could also significantly affect the efficiency of solar energy conversion. In theory, this device temperature can vary from room temperature all the way to thousands of degrees. And just by concentrating a sunlight, so you don't need to input additional energy. A unique example that utilizes all these three parameters is the photon-enhanced thermion emission that has been developed in Melostrum. It is also natural to utilize the thermal energy combined with the temperature gradient driving force. Just by carefully choosing this device temperature, you not only create such a gradient, but also facilitate such uh, certain process in solar energy conversion, such as the thermionic emission in thermal thermionic converter or the chemical reaction in a thermal chemical cycle. However, it is not common to combine the temperature of the device with the photovoltaic driving force. In, in fact, in solar cells, it has been proved that increasing temperature only decreases the efficiency. So, how about in a PEC cell? It is generally believed that in PEC cells, the same theory in solar cells can apply to the PEC cells because they share some analogous parts. But it is not necessary to. Actually, there's no uh, direct experimental proof on this point. So the question I want to ask is, is ambient temperature really the optimal condition for PEC cells? To answer this question, I made a list of a bunch of uh, temperature effects that could have on PEC cells. First of all, the photovoltage decreases with increasing temperature. This is well known in solar cells. As you increase the temperature, the intrinsic carrier concentration increases so the quasi-Fermi level splitting decreases. And thermodynamically, the entropy of the water splitting reaction actually goes up with temperature, which causes a decrease in the free energy cost. So that is a beneficial effect. Kinetically, it is also straightforward to understand that catalysis goes up with temperature because the reaction becomes faster at elevated temperatures. So what else? As I read more literature, I realized that the materials that people use in this photo anode is actually quite different from traditional semiconductors like silicon. So these are transition metal oxides. They have very different materials properties and very different temperature dependence. One of the biggest difference is the carrier mobility. The carrier mobility describes how fast the electron and poles can move within the semiconductor. So in silicon, for example, these carrier mobilities are already very fast at room temperature. They actually decrease slightly uh, with increasing temperature. However, in these transition metal oxides, the carrier mobility actually was, it is quite slow at room temperature, but they are strongly activated by the thermal energy. So this is because in semiconductors like silicon, the carriers conduct in a delocalized band, typically composed with S and P electrons while in the transition metal oxides, there are localized states from the d band electrons or the defects. These localized states can trap the electrons or holes when they conduct. That makes very slow uh, carrier mobility. But they are, this hopping conduction mechanism is strongly activated by the temperature. So that's why the carrier mobility in transition metal oxide goes up with temperature. And that's something we need to consider as well. So the current research in PEC cells 
focus on ambient temperature. They assume that the loss in the photovoltage will overwhelm the gains from all the other beneficial effects. But it is not necessarily true, especially in transition metal oxide. So motivated by that, I carried out an extensive exploration in this elevated temperature photoless chemistry and try to figure out at which temperature we should operate in PEC cells. And that comes to the outline of my talk today. First, I will show you how we understand the non-trivial effect of temperature on PEC water splitting based on a model system. Then, I will explicitly, explicitly demonstrate that thermal energy could be a beneficial and efficient way to improve the performance of the photo panel. And in the last part, I will further extend the temperature beyond 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point of water. I will show you why this temperature is a critical temperature that introduces more challenge, but also more opportunities. So first, let's see how does the temperature affect photo edge chemical water splitting. The material that I chose in this study is hematite, or iron oxide. This material has been researched and improved as a photo anode for many years. It has suitable band gap for water splitting. It is abundant, it is non-toxic, and more importantly, it's thermally very stable. So that's why I chose this material initially for this study, because I don't need to worry about degradation at higher temperatures. A second reason, hematite is well known for its strongly activated mobility with temperature. So if you look at this plot, the mobility in the hematite increases exponentially with temperature, as opposed to the slightly decreased mobility in silicon. For the purpose of fundamental study, I used a hematite thin film as a model system without any catalyst. So this thin film is deposited by post-laser deposition, a technique that uses high-energy lasers to ablate material from the target and deposit under controlled temperature and controlled oxygen partial pressure. This allows us to achieve very flat and smooth thin films with high crystallinity as shown in these characterizations. The titanium doping in hematite is to provide sufficient electronic conduction and also makes this material an anti-semitic So let me show you the JV characteristic of the hematite photo atom. I'm going to show you this kind of JV plot for several times uh, throughout my talk, so let me explain some details. The x-axis here is the bias that you apply between the, uh, the photo, photo anode and a reference electrode, which is a reversible hydrogen ele electrode in this case. The y-axis is the current density, which is the total current divided by the projected area of the photo anode. And also labeled in this plot is the redox potential for water oxidation or oxygen evolution reaction, which is 1.23 volt at room temperature. So as you can see, the dark current arises much later than this potential indicating an overpotential that is needed to overcome the reaction barrier. While the photo current arises earlier than this potential, that's because there's a photo voltage generated in the semiconductor. So in terms of performance, we want the photo current to be even higher and to arise as early as possible. So by definition, the earlier direction is a cathodic direction, while the anodic direction in this plot is, means the larger bias. So here is the temperature dependent JV characteristic for the hematite photo panel. Let's look at the dark current first. The dark current shifts in the cathodic direction, which is the same direction as the redox potential shift. While the dark current shifts for a larger amount than the redox potential shift, this is because there's a convoluted effect of the thermally enhanced catalysis so looking at the photo current, the photo current shifts anodically. This is expected because the photo voltage drops with increasing temperature as we discussed. However, there's no net improvement in the photo current. So you may immediately conclude that increasing temperature is bad for hematite photo anode. But wait a minute. As I look closer to this JV plot, we actually can see a hint of thermal enhancement. You can see that the photocurrent at higher temperatures 
seems to arise faster and can eventually catch up with the photo current at lower temperatures. This can be viewed more obviously in this semi-log plot that the photo current arise at higher temperatures exhibit a faster transition from the reaction limiting regime to the saturation regime. Such a faster transition is actually quite different from solar cells, where typically a slower transition is associated with the temperature, higher temperatures. To, model, to understand this behavior, I modeled this hematite photo anode with a shock ejection diode in series with the electrolyzer with a shared interface. I fitted <coughs> this JD characteristic with an ideality factor and a short circuit current. The ideality factor describes the recombination and, uh, and the charge transfer properties at this hematite interface, while the short circuit current describes ideally how many carriers you can collect from this hematite. It, that includes the carriers generated in the space travel region plus the carriers that's beyond the space time region, but within the minority carrier diffusion lab. That is the effective absorption lab in hemitime. The fitting results shows that there indeed is a thermal enhancement in such a combined parameter with an activation energy around 0.1 eV. So I attributed this thermal enhancement to the following reasons. First, as you increase the temperature, the reaction kinetics increases. And that causes a faster hole extraction rate at this interface, and that gives you a smaller ideality factor, closer to one. And for short circuit current, we know that the mobility in the hemitype is increased exponentially with temperature. So that could possibly cause a longer minority carrier diffusion length if the carrier lifetime doesn't strongly depend on temperature. So that means a longer minority carrier diffusion length gives you a longer effective absorption length and therefore a larger short circuit current. So a combined effect of these two gives rise to a thermal enhancement that we see in the photo current transition. So in a brief summary, with the help of the hematite photo anode, we clearly see that how does the temperature affect photo edge chemical cell from different ways. The photocurrent anodic shift indicates a photovoltaic drop with increasing temperature, while the faster photocurrent transition can be attributed to a combined effect of both catalysis and carrier mobility. But as we said, there's no net current improvement, photocurrent improvement in this hematite photoanode. So it looks like increasing temperature is not worthwhile. But we want to know why. So I looked closer to this band diagram, and I realized that there are a lot of surface states at this hemitype liquid interface, which is well established from literature. So these surface states serve as recondition centers for electron and pulse. So even though at high, high temperatures, there may be extra holes that can reach this interface, but they will just recombine at these surface states rather than participate in the oxygen evolution reaction. So therefore, you don't see increased photocurrent. So to confirm this hypothesis, I added pulse scavenger, a sodium sulfide. So the sodium sulfide replaced the water oxidation reaction by the sulfide oxidation reaction, which is kinetically much faster. And in fact, it serves as a sink for the holes that can reach this surface. Typically, it is assumed that the pulse scavenger can give you 100% collection of holes so that the surface recognition now becomes a much minor process in compared, as compared to sulfide oxidation. So indeed, as we increase the temperature, we do see an increase in photo current. And such an increase is more significant if we compare the sulfide oxidation to water oxidation. So that confirmed our first, our first hypothesis that the competition between the surface recognition and the catalytic activity plays an important role to determine whether we will see a net photo current investment. And second, I also thought about the competition between the width of the space charge region and the minority carrier diffusion length. So imagine that if the minority carrier diffusion length is much smaller than the space charge region width, then even though this 
diffusion length increases the temperature, its net effect on the effective absorption length is very small. So such a competition has been modeled by Butler in 1977 based on semiconductor physics. So this equation assumes that the reaction kinetics at the surface is infinitely fast. And also, it also assumes 100% collection efficiency within the space time region due to the built-in electric field so that the temperature dependence within the space time region is neglected. So as we put in uh, habitat parameters, and I vary the minority carrier diffusion length from one to three nanometer uh, to mimic or represent a thermal enhancement, we saw a slight increase in photo current. And I, if I intentionally, intentionally increase this number to be longer than the space time region width and still vary by a factor of three, then we saw a much, much significant improvement in the photo curve. So that tells us we should choose a material that has, mu has longer minority carry diffusion length as compared to the space time region width. So keeping these two factors in mind, we carefully selected a second material system and explicitly demonstrated that thermal, thermal energy could be a beneficial and efficient way to improve its actual performance. And this material is business magnetic with some molybdenum doping. We chose this material because, first, the minority carrier diffusion length in business magnetic is much longer than the iron oxide. And second, it also exhibits a hopping conduction mechanism, which indicates that the mobility, the carrier mobility, can be strongly uh, activated with thermal energy. And in order to connect as many, part, uh, as many carriers as possible, we synthesize this nanoporous business magnetic by electrodeposition. The particle size is around 110 nanometer, which is only slightly larger than the diffusion length. We also added a cobophosphate or co pi catalyst on top of this photoanode to improve the reaction kinetics while suppress the uh, surface recomposition. So, before I go into more mechanistic analysis, let me show you this final result for temperature-dependent photo, uh, photo curve. So just by slightly increasing the temperature from 10 to 42 degrees Celsius, we see a more than 150% increase in photo current. And such an increase is much more significant as we compare to hematite photo -anode. And second, as we learned from the hematite photo -anode, we also saw this faster photocurrent transition in a BBL photoanode. As for the onset potential, the onset potential only shifts slightly in the allotted direction. So without any quantitative analysis, we can already see that this significantly improved saturation photocurrent plus the faster photocurrent transition already overweighs the slightly anodic shift of onset potential. And such a thermal, uh, thermal enhancement is actually quite stable over 30 hour stability measurement. Uh, the degradation is mainly due to surface catalyst rather than the BBO by itself. And more importantly, the degradation is actually independent of temperature. So the next question is, how do we understand this mechanism be behind the thermal enhancement? So from the knowledge of hematite photoanalyte, we can tell that the total, ideally the total carrier that we can collect <coughs> within the space charge region plus the minority carrier diffusion length beyond this space charge region. So imagine this is a BBO particle with some surface catalyst on the right side and the back side contact on the left side, which is not shown here. In order for this particle to produce <coughs> any photocurrent, it first needs to absorb sunlight and generate electron hole pairs. And second, the holes need to migrate to the space charge region in order, to, in order to be separated from electrons. And then these holes need to get extracted by the reaction, the charge transfer reaction. And finally, the majority carrier, the electrons, need to transport all the way to the backside to be collected. So in principle, any of these processes could be the very limiting step that determines the photo curve. So in order to rigorously say that the minority carrier diffusion length is the cause, we need to carefully rule out all the other possibilities. And that's what we did. 
So first we make sure that the film thickness is longer than the characteristic absorption length, so the absorption is not limiting. And then we compare the photocurrent for water oxidation with the photocurrent for sulfide oxidation in whole scavenger solution, and make sure that the surface catalyst is sufficiently efficient for water oxidation. And finally, we also eliminate the possibility of majority carrier transport by choosing the molybdenum doping level to provide sufficient electronic conduction within the film thickness. So it leaves the only possibility to be the minority carrier diffusion length that could determine the photo current. And that means the thermal enhancement in the saturation photo current could be only due to the thermally activated minority carrier diffusion length. And we should note that any improvement in the minority carrier diffusion length means that the thermally enhanced minority carrier mobility must overweigh any decrease in the carrier lifetime, if there's any with temperature. So in order to provide additional evidence on the thermally enhanced minority carrier diffusion length, we compare the photo current in two different uh, BBO photo adults with different particle sizes the nanopores and macropores BBO. For the nanopores BBO, you can see that the photocurrent increases strongly with temperature and soon reaches a plateau at around 35, 35 degrees Celsius. While for the macropores BBO, the photocurrent starts at a low value and rises at a slower rate. This is probably because the smaller surface area to volume ratio in this macropores BBO. But it continuously increased at almost a constant rate all the way to 80 degrees Celsius, which is the highest temperature we can achieve in our experimental setup. So we can rationalize this different temperature dependence with the same schematic picture that we used for minority carrier diffusion length. In nanopore video, we know that at lower temperatures, the minority carrier diffusion length is smaller than the particle size. So that's why it determines the photocurrent yield. As the temperature increases, the diffusion length increases, so the photocurrent increases. But there is a critical temperature at which the minority carrier diffusion length becomes comparable with the particle size, so that it no longer determines the photocurrent. As you further increase the temperature, you will see this plateau in the photocurrent. However, for the macropore video, due to the large particle size, the minority carrier diffusion length is always smaller than the particle size within the temperature range we investigated. So it never reaches a plateau. And that's why the photocurrent increases continuously. And that provides me additional evidence that the thermal enhancement in the photocurrent could be only due to the improved minority carrier collection rather than electric catalysis, because electric catalysis should improve all the time. And also, what should be noted is that the macropores video actually can achieve any photo current level with this nanopore video just by increasing temperature a little bit more. So that tells us thermal energy is an effective route to activating BBO without too much nanostructure. So we know nanostructure is a very good route to, for charge separation, but it also sometimes introduces more charge uh, surface recondition or more degradation. So our result provides an alternative strategy to improve the photo current, but without extensive nanostructure. In addition to this photo current enhancement, we are also interested, interested to know the weakly dependent on the potential of temperature. So we try to measure the photo voltage loss with temperature, and that's being achieved with the reversible redox couple. So as shown in this band diagram, the photo voltage is measured between the majority carrier Fermi level and this redox potential. So this re reversible redox potential exhibits the same redox potential as for the water oxidation or oxygen conversion reaction. And the full voltage in BBO drops at a rate of 2.1 millivolt per Kelvin. This is consistent with most semiconductors. But this value is larger than the offset potential shift. And this can be explained first by the kinetics. So increasing the temperature improves the reaction kinetics, and therefore the overpotential drops with temperature. And second, 
thermodynamically, the redox potential for water oxidation also decreases with increasing temperature. So the combined effect of all these three gives rise to a weakly dependent uh, onset potential with temperature. In order to further compensate this photo voltage loss, we added a silicon to the backside of the BBO to boost the photo voltage. And as this is a, uh, fabricated in a monolithic way by adding a tin oxide in between as a buffer here. So as you can see from this band diagram, the tin oxide forms an ohmic contact with BBO, which facilitates the majority carrier transfer, while the tin oxide forms a shocky junction with silicon which gives rise to an additional photovoltage. And the total photovoltage is a sum of two. And as compared to uh, the milestone works for monolithic BBO-based photoanode in literature, we see that our device exhibits a lower onset potential and higher photo current at elevated temperatures. And this device is also stable over 30 hours stability measurement and with Faraday efficiency of about 90% which is also independent of temperature. So to brief, briefly summarize, we have explicitly demonstrated that increasing the temperature could actually improve the performance in a BBO photo analog. The thermally enhanced saturation photo current can be attributed to the thermally activated minority carrier diffusion lamp, and the photo voltage loss is mitigated by the combined effect of catalysis and thermodynamics. So it is clear that the optimal temperature for BBO photoanode is above ambient temperature. And our strategy for thermal enhancement is actually generalizable to any oxide that exhibits hopping, me hopping conduction mechanism. And it also provides an alternative strategy to improve the PEC activity without extensive nanostructure. So looking back to the fundamental picture, Besides tuning the temperature by itself, what we actually want to do is to combine, to combine the temperature with the photovoltage driving force. So in general, increasing the photovoltage or increasing the driving force usually gives you a higher efficiency. So such a driving force can be achieved by solar concentration, which is well known in solar cell. We also observe that in our hematite photoanode, so increase Increasing the light intensity decreases the onset potential. So that requires us to explore in a much wider range combined with temperature and photovoltage or solar concentration. So it is very likely that now the optimal temperature will shift to a higher temperature because you are now drawing more current densities under concentrated sunlight. And higher current density will rely on more catalysis and more carrier mobility. However, here comes the challenge. There's a 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of water. So the existing PEC cell is designed to work under aqueous electrolyte. As the water boils, there's no pathway for ionic transport. Actually, in spite of this challenge, there's additional benefits to going beyond 100 degrees Celsius, such as the charge transfer kinetics be becomes even faster this not only includes the reaction kinetics, but any kinetic charge transfer across interfaces. The gas diffusion and release becomes faster in the gas phase as compared to the liquid phase. And we also have easier control in the gas partial pressure, which is another knob to tune for reaction kinetics. So that requires us to innovatively design a liquid-free PEC cell that could work under temperatures significantly beyond 100 degrees Celsius and under concentrated light. And that comes to the third part of my talk today. I will show you how we achieve this. And here is the schematic design of the liquid-free PEC cell. It is inspired from the traditional, semi, uh, traditional solid oxide fuel cell with, where it is a dense solid electrolyte sandwiched by two porous electrodes. The difference is one of the electrodes need to be photoactive. So we propose it to be a nanocomposite of light absorber and ionic conductor. Both materials need to be percolated to ensure electronic and ionic conduction simultaneously. 
So let me explain some how does this device work. So under illumination, the electron hole pairs will be generated inside a semiconducting light absorber as the hole migrates to the interface with the ionic conductor. There's a chance that it can jump into the valence band of this ionic conductor. So if this ionic conductor has some electronic conduction, which makes it a mixed ionic electronic conductor, the holes can further migrate for a longer distance. While in the case this ionic conductor has no electronic conduction, then the holes will be restricted within the vicinity of the triple phase boundary, where the electronic phase, the ionic phase, and the gas phase meet. So as the hole meets a oxygen ion from the ionic conductor, they can react and release oxygen. And on the other hand, the electrons will be collected by the external circuit and complete the reaction on the counter electron. So I have carried out a complete simulation on this kind of geometry based on a one-dimensional detailed balance model. Without going into too much details, the results shows that under 200x solar conservation, a practical efficiency above 10% actually can be achieved within a broad range of temperature around 400 degrees Celsius for a non-degenerate semiconductor. So encouraged by this simulation result, we moved on to realize our idea experimentally. And this is the first demonstration experimentally for the liquid-free PEC cell under high concentration sunlight and high temperature. So there's still um, ongoing efforts to, for device optimization that my colleagues and I will keep working on. But I'm very excited to show you this very first proof of concept result. So in this proof of concept, I still use the business vanadate as the light absorbing material. Although we know that the optimal temperature for business vanadate is slightly above ambient temperature. But we still use this material because we have abundant knowledge of how this material behaves with increasing temperature. And second, in the ionic conductor, I use this copper doped bismuth vanadium oxide, which is well known for its oxygen ion conduction at intermediate temperatures around 400 degrees Celsius. And we also expect this material to have to form a better interface with bismuth vanadate because they share some <coughs> similar elements. And we go ahead and fabricated the device based on this schematic. And the uh, the electrolyte and the counter electrode are traditional materials from solid oxide fuel cells. The photoanode is deposited by spin coating. For demonstration, we use a concentrated blue laser as a light source. And the device is placed in a single chamber environment with oxygen. So the counter electrode is now doing oxygen reduction reaction instead of water splitting reaction. So there's no water splitting. But it doesn't change the chemistry on the photoanode which is oxygen evolution reaction. And we carry out the electrical measurement across this counter electrode and the buried current collector. And here I show you how does the photovoltaic behave as a function of temperature. The first message we can get from this plot is that this device is working. So we do have a photovoltaic under illumination. And second, the photovoltaic behaves quite unusual. As you can see, the photovoltaic peaks at around 350 degrees Celsius of about 200 millivolts. It is in contrast with solar cells where photovoltaic decreases monotonically with temperature. We also observed that in a liquid cell measurement that the photovoltaic in BBO decreases monotonically with temperature. We can actually extrapolate this photovoltaic to higher temperatures and consider some solar concentration effect. And as we see, the photovoltaic we measured in liquid-free uh, PEC cell is actually quite reasonable and agrees, agrees pretty well with the extrapolation. And that tells us we have demonstrated experimentally for the first time a working liquid-free PEC cell under temperatures as high as 400 degrees Celsius. Although the photovoltaic is still limited, due to the intrinsic limitation in BBO. And photocurrent current was measured but limited by ionic transport and reaction kinetics at this point. So there's still some uh, optimization remain to be done. So in order to 
understand this unusual behavior of the photovoltage, I first confirmed that such a large photovoltage can only achieve with the coexistence of bismuth vanadate and bismuth co copper vanadium oxide. So there's a synergistic effect between the semiconductor and the ionic conductor. So it is reasonable to rationalize a charge separation picture at the triple phase boundary. So here I show you a band diagram that shows the band bending within the semiconductor toward this triple phase boundary. So the redox level in this case is now determined by both the gas phase and the ionic conductor. So under elimination, the uh, quasi fermi level splitting will be created within the semiconductor. But it does not necessarily attribute to a photovoltage. So imagine if the reaction kinetics is extremely slow, so there's no holes can be extracted, then there will be no photovoltage to be measured. If there's some hole extraction rate or some reaction happens at this interface, so we can observe some photovoltage. But this photovoltage can be very small if the back reaction with the electrons dominate. Ideally, we want to have a faster hole extraction rate as compared to the back reaction with the electron so that we can observe a larger photovoltage. So that kind of explains our thermally enhanced <coughs> photovoltage because it seems that increasing temperature favors the whole extraction more than the back reaction. And such a back reaction can be further suppressed by changing the gas environment. So we indeed observe an improved photovoltage by reducing the oxygen partial pressure. So by reducing the oxygen partial pressure, pressure, first thermodynamically, we are moving this redox potential upward which causes a less driving force or less band bending. So that is not good for whole voltage. But kinetically, reducing the oxygen partial pressure favors the oxygen evolution reaction while suppresses the oxygen reduction reaction, which is the bad reaction here. So our results suggest that the kinetics, it dominates the effect of oxygen partial pressure in our device. So in a brief summary, I have explicit, I have successfully built this liquid-free PC cell that can work under temperatures as high as 400 degrees Celsius and under concentrated light. The unusual behavior of photovoltage suggests that temperature plays an even more complicated role in this liquid-free PC cells. But there's still a lot of work to be done to develop this idea. We need more fundamental understanding. We need to explore more materials. And of course, we need to optimize the device in order to improve photovoltage and photo current. On the device level optimization, we have been working on this self-suspended membrane with a very dense, a very thin electrolyte to minimize the ohmic loss across the cell. And this is inspired by the micro-solid oxide fuel cells that is specifically designed for temperatures as low as 400 degrees Celsius. So, taking all, everything all together, during my PhD study, I have carried out extensive exploration in this elevated temperature foliage chemical cell. And my results shows that we should embrace thermal energy in the process of solar to fuel conversion. I can imagine there are two strategies to pursue beyond this point. First, we can further develop the liquid, uh, the PEC cell in the liquid with moderate temperature. Such a temperature can be easily achieved just by on-chip solar concentrator or by such kind of parabolic glass container. Another way, we can develop the liquid-free PEC cell to operate at even higher temperatures. And this could be viewed as an add-on device on the existing concentrated solar power plant. With that, here comes to the favorite part of my talk today. So first I would like to thank uh, the funding resources to make sure that uh, money is not a limiting factor in my research. And second, uh, thanks for all the committee members. Thanks for your time uh, to serve on my committee, defense committee.
and Professor Xiaoling, Professor Paul, and Professor Yi. Um, personally, I don't have too much direct interaction with you, but I'm really impressed by all your impressed and inspired by all your research, especially uh, the work on the BBO for an adult and also the work on titanium protection layer and also many uh, nanostructure and synthesis methods. This work really impact a lot on my PhD research. Nick and Will, I really feel very fortunate to be mentored by both of you. So Nick is like a father to me. I know I can rely on him anytime. Will is like an elder brother. He watches <laughs> my <laughs> So I still remember that when I first came to Stanford, I talked to Nick and I wanted to join his group. But after a few days, Nick told me that whether I was interested in a project that was collaborated, that would be collaborated with a professor that was not here yet. And that's how, and I said yes, so that's how I became <laughs> Will's first student in, in Nick's office. <laughs> for a long time after that, I had this regular one-on-two -on -two meeting one graduate student with two professors. <laughs> I know most of you won't have this special experience. That's, that's kind of fun. I actually was quite nervous every week or every other week. But that really helped my research to take off very quickly at the beginning. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Will. And also, I would like to thank all the course instructors. So they provide me with a very uh, solid background in material science research. Of course, uh, my two co important colleagues, Li Ming and Major, who I worked with, with very closely on this project. So I really enjoyed uh, working with both of you, and I learned a lot from you guys. So I think we formed a perfect team. So I'm a physics background. Li Ming is a chemistry background, and Major is a uh, material science background. So I think we are the perfect team on this project. And of course, I had a great time with both the Chu group and the Malosh group. So uh, the good thing to be a member of two groups is that you have two group trips, yeah. uh, double group trips. So uh, for the time being, I'm sorry I couldn't read out all your names, but I really enjoy to be working with all of you. Um, especially I want to thank Jared and the rest of the Peak subgroup. So they helped me a lot with the fundamental understanding and experiments at the very beginning of my PhD study. And of course, all the staffs, they created a very comfortable research environment for us so that I can focus 100% on my research, especially for Mark Gibson. I know, uh, as many of you know, that Mark does a really great job helping us receive and ship packages. I remember three years ago when we first received this PLD, pulse laser deposition system, it was like 7 p.m. in winter, but we don't know what to do with it. It's a huge crate that like, all of us cannot move, just move it into the building. And, but we couldn't just leave it in the loading dock overnight. And it was Mark who came at that time, like it was 7 p.m., and helped us like, solve this problem just as he always did. So uh, thanks, Mark. And also, uh, Sylvia uh, has helped us a lot with all the administrative process. And I know she, uh, today is her birthday, so happy birthday to her. <laughs> um, and of course, my friends at Stanford, especially the hop hop party and the bottle <laughs> team. <laughs> uh, I'm very proud to say that our bottle team has won three intramural championships at Stanford. Oh. So, and some of our members are here too. <laughs> And definitely, I want to thank my parents. Uh, they are currently in China and couldn't come to the defense today. But they have been always very supportive. And they have provided me with the best education they could since I was a child. And so that I can stand here and defend, and, and defend as a PhD student. So thanks to my parents. And finally, uh, Anwar, my girlfriend. Uh, you're really amazing, and you're being very supportive, and more than you, uh, you couldn't be more, 
you couldn't be more supportive in the past few weeks, so I, I couldn't express more, but thank you. Uh, this photo was taken in, on a, our friend's wedding ceremony, so I hope one day we will be that post. <laughs> so, thank you all for your attention, and I'm open to any questions. <laughs> Actually, there's a blank region on top, which is the temperature that we couldn't reach with certain solar concentration. So it, it actually uh, depends on the total energy balance between how much solar energy you can store or you can like, utilize and how much energy you produce electricity or how much energy that you emit just as a, a radiation. So you need to consider all of those and actually the temperature we can reach just by concentrating the sunlight is pretty high. As you can see from this calculation, it can reach as high as like 600 or 700 degrees Celsius. So you don't need to put input ex uh, additional energy to get to that temperature. Okay, so when you do this uh, calculation, the temperature is the temperature of the photo panel or the temperature of your water? Oh, uh, I also include so in this simulation, we include the flow rate of water, and so the temperature is for the whole device. The water needs to be heated up as well, so everything is included in this case. How sensitive is your calculation the temperature to your flow rate? It really depends on how much water yeah, you have there. that's true. Uh, I do have a... That's a very good question. So I do have a backup back slide here. So here is the, uh, the effect of the flow rate of my calculation. So as you can see here, so the blue line is a high flow rate. So if you use a very high flow rate, you, you cannot reach all the temperatures that you want. So you only reach the, this point, but you cannot be, go beyond to reach a higher temperature or higher efficiency, an optimal temperature. But with the slower flow rate, you can reach uh, as many temperature, like the optimal temperature you want. So it, it does have a very, uh, it does have an impact on what temperature you want to reach. So under what concentration? Uh, this is under, yeah, 200 X concentration. It, it also depends on the concentration. So you mentioned uh, degradation, um, so the cobalt phosphide catalyst. So when you move the two elevated temperatures with the distance band date and the global scope distance band date, um, what, how stable are these materials? Um, have you seen any degradation um, for time scope? Um, I've had elevated temperatures like 400 degrees Celsius when you're looking at photo voltage. Do you know that these materials are stable in these temperature regimes because some materials do degrade? That, that's a very good question. So uh, without Illumination, I believe the business validate is stable under these photo anode conditions, so oxygen environment, 400 degrees Celsius, because the, these materials are annealed or synthesized at such high temperatures or even higher temperatures uh, in air. But under illumination, it is a good question that uh, I do see some degradation for the BBO at such high temperatures. So under illumination, there might be some corrosion on the surface with the gas or Maybe there's some reaction, additional reaction, side reactions happen on the unit, uh, at the surface. But uh, at this point, I don't know what, what's going on there. But there is. A, a Uh, the ionic 
semiconductor has a different uh, crystal phase. So it is very important to make sure you have the business bandwidth phase and the ionic conductor, the business copper vanadium oxide phase. And that's what I make sure after my synthesis. So I saw two different phases from XRG. One last question. Yes. Um, so I think in your uh, you might have a three electro system that you have a reference electro to calibrate your uh, working electro and which the reference electro might be calibrated on a different temperature. I was wondering uh, how can you do the reference in a high temperature device? That is very interesting. Because uh, uh, you might have a counter that is uh, an oxygen reduction that the, the, the potential is also shifting when you change the temperature. That's also a very good question. So using the reference electrode at solid oxide fuel cells at such high temperatures is always a very like open question. People don't know what is the good procedure to do that. Like um, one typical way is you can put a platinum, porous platinum on top of the electrode, elect, uh, on top of the electrolyte. So you share the same electrolyte, but you have a side uh, electrode for the platinum and use that as a reference electrode. I've tried that, but it doesn't seem to work very well. Maybe something due to the reversibility of this electrode. Yeah, but that's a very good question that we need to think about. Uh, so right now, we are just doing the two electrode, not the three electrode. Mode. And the good thing is, since we are doing uh, the photoanode, and the cathode, which is hydrogen evolution reaction, usually is much faster. So or more reversible than the anode. Okay, with that, let's thank Shabby one more time. <laughs> this concludes the public part of the thesis defense. Thank you. Send you the aroma.